Okay, we're going to start by working through this mix demo. You should have got, uh, hopefully you all saw the email from me yesterday afternoon. Um, and hopefully you won't hold it against me if you already started on or completed your uh, 10 layers for your SoundCloud. I just realized, uh, I came to the realization as I was feeling questions from people. One, I didn't get as far as I wanted to in Tuesday's class so that you could complete it before today's class. Uh, and two, I've realized that if I took time today to tell you how to complete it, it was going to distract from where I needed to get you to do your unit project for next week. So that's my reason for scrapping it. Um, a few of you have, have finished it up, and a few of you might want to still finish it up. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is say that uh, you can use that to make up if you had a missing homework assignment. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, take it as credit for that if you want to. Uh, bounce it and post it to SoundCloud. We're going to cover bouncing today as part of our mix demonstration. So I'm doing kind of the Pro Tools demo at the first half of class today, and then I want to talk uh, a little bit more content-wise uh, as far as how to prepare for your uh, unit project that's due next Thursday, okay? Which is going to bring together some of these skills that we've been working on in Pro Tools, okay? So we're diving right into a Pro Tools demonstration, um, and we are jumping in with this mix demo that I had you just download. So you should have downloaded uh, this file that you see right here, mix demo PT10. I made sure that it was a Pro Tools 10 file. It's in Blackboard in today's folder. Is everybody able to download this? Confirmation, negative or positive would be good. Okay, good, okay. Um, if you downloaded it, you, you had a, no problem unzipping it. If you just double click it, it should expand into a folder which looks like our, our typical Pro Tools sessions. Okay. Uh, talk to, Ken's talk to somebody next to you to get you up to speed because we're diving right into Pro Tools today. Um, this folder then, I want you, there should be two Pro Tools sessions in there, okay? Yours are going to be PTX files because I made, I made sure that they were PT. There were uh, Pro Tools 10 files, not Pro Tools 9 files for you guys. Uh, but I want you to, just bear with me now, click on the one that says Start, because that's where we're going to start. Okay. I might need this over here. There we go. Okay, I think it's because I was in a pub. Okay. So once again, uh, uh, if you see this uh, session notes about your uh, inputs changing, hopefully you don't because I hopefully I anticipated that and fixed it. You don't need a detailed report, so hit no. Okay, and you should see something that looks like this as the start of your session. Is everybody there? Good? Bad? Ugly? Okay, all right. So this is what we're starting with. Well, I've started, I, I wanted to bring in a project that would kind of uh, start to approach what we're looking for for the unit project for next week, which is a, a sound design, kind of cre creating uh, the soundtrack to go with a, a movie, okay? In this session, there is not a movie to go with this, but you can kind of imagine this as a scene in a movie. Bless you, okay? Um, so what I've done here is I've created kind of some, uh, some events, some ambience, some dialogue to go with our kind of imagined scene, if you will. Uh, those are divided up into layers in this session, okay? Uh, but I've got a few layers I want to add, and I want to walk you through uh, importing some material to add uh, additional layers to this as well, okay? So <clears throat> if you were to hit play, you'll notice that you've got uh, a few things here. You've got me talking. Let's see, i got to turn up the volume over here. Oh, no? can you turn up my volume? Oh, I know why. Stop. I'm going to actually change my... You guys should leave your output on the fast track and plug your headphones in, but I'm going to actually use my built-in so that it comes through the recording this time around. Okay. Let's see if this works. And it's not going to work. Excellent. Okay. So now I'm having output issues. Yeah, same here. My computer wouldn't output the first place, actually. Okay, let me try a fast track. I'm hearing something. There we go. Okay, so it seems like for some reason mine output one and two is set up to be the fast track. I wanted to use the uh, actual system settings because 
Uh, this is going to mess up with my recording because you're not actually going to hear what's coming out of my session when you play this back. So unfortunately, I, I can't troubleshoot that right now. Um, but at least you'll be able to see what I'm doing with Pro Tools, okay? Uh, okay, so right now you should see that there are three layers, right? Three tracks that I've already set up. One, which is uh, me talking into the microphone. Uh, the first one, which are kind of car drive-by noises. And the other one, which are kind of siren whoops and wails. Now, what do you notice that's different between the, the, the dialogue, the, the car sounds, and the siren sounds? It's particularly what's different about the siren sounds on those, that track when you look at it. Stereo. Yeah, stereo. Okay. Uh, that's where I was going. Uh, you should notice that there, when you look at the siren track, you actually see two waveforms on that track. Okay, whenever you have a stereo track, you're going to actually see two waveforms on a single track, and you can tell that it's a single track because it's the same color. Okay, but what it's showing you is the left channel and the right channel. Okay, so this is a stereo track that's been set up by, by Pro Tools. You remember when we did track setups, when we did new, one of these options right here was for mono. If you need to create a stereo track because you've got stereo sound files you want to drop into your project, that's where you would set up that option to set up a, a stereo track, okay? You need a stereo track to handle stereo sound files. You need a mono track to handle mono sound files, okay? Make sense? Should be pretty self-explanatory there, okay? So what we're doing now, if, if you play through this and listen to it in your headphones, you'll hear me talking a little bit. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so looking at this little, I mean, let me use the zoomer tool here. I'm going to zoom in on this part of it, okay? So you should notice in track one, I'm talking here, yes? But what happens as soon as the car drives by? Okay. Yeah, the, the sound of the car overpowers the sound of the voice, yes? Okay. This is where mixing comes into play, okay? You need to, as you're building multiple layers, multiple tracks in your, in your project, and your project for this video assignment, you're going to need to have up to, uh, at least five discernible layers in your project, okay? I'm putting that out there. You need to make sure that you've got a balance between those layers, okay? Just dragging and dropping things into the edit window is not going to get you there. That's where the mix window comes into play, okay? I started to show you this last time, but... In the mix window, you see I've got the same two tracks. I've got my voice, because I've properly labeled my uh, tracks with usable names other than audio 1, audio 2, audio etc. Okay? And then I've got my cars track. Okay? I don't need my car to be as uh, loud or louder than my voice. right? In fact, if I, so what, what I need to do, in fact, I don't want it to be as loud as my voice, right? because the voice is the main part of this scene, if you will. Okay? Think of this, if you're a visual person, of, of being kind of like foregrounding and backgrounding things, okay? A lot of what mixing is, is determining what's going to be in the foreground of your audio and what's going to be in the background of your audio, okay? Because it's not going to happen automatically. You need to work with the mixer to get things balanced so that certain sounds jump up and are in the foreground and certain sounds are in the back in the background, okay? Make sense? Everybody understand that concept? Okay. So... The, the easiest thing to do, the first line of defense, is to pull down the fader knob. So this, this fader uh, slider here says volume. If you click and drag it, it'll actually lower the volume. And if you play it back now, it's better, right? Maybe not exactly what I want, but I can pull it down even more. Okay, now you can hear my voice better. Yes? Okay. So again... First line of defense is lowering the volume knob, okay? Uh, but it does not end, mixing does not end there. As I said, it's the first line of defense. I've said that a couple times, basically, okay? But if all you do is lower volume, you're probably not going to get as far as you want with your mix, okay? And, and mixing is a discipline unto itself. We could do a whole course just on mixing techniques. I want to give you a few key tools today to get a satisfactory mix between your layers of your audio, okay? So, first line of defense, everybody gets volume slider, pulling that down, okay? Um, I talked about panning last time. What do you notice about the pan 
knobs here between these different layers. Because we have mono tracks and stereo tracks, what do you notice just in the construction of the tracks that's different? Yeah, Alex. Yeah, there's two dials, yeah, there's two dials in stereo. Okay. Each of those dials, one of them is for the left channel, one of them is for the right channel of your audio. Okay. And by default, on a stereo track, the left is going to be turned all the way to the left, so that it comes out of the left speaker. The right is going to be turned all the way to the right, so it comes out of the right speaker. Okay? That allows you to recreate whatever stereo effect you've got in your recorded stereo sound file. Okay? Now, you may decide that you want your stereo effect to be a little more slanted to the right-hand side, in which case you can do something like that. Turn up the left so it's at 12 o'clock. Leave the right so it's all the way to the right. Okay? But by default, it's going to be left and right. Now, if I decide in this scene that the car driving by, I don't want that right in the dead center of my uh, track, right? And in fact, if I pan over here, I tried to, in the edit window, let me zoom back out here. You'll see that I've got this car driving by at the same time that I've got a whoop. Okay, you hear how the siren goes from that way? From uh, I guess for you guys, that's um, it's. It, this always messes me up because it's backwards for you guys. So that's left over there, right? So it goes from left to right. Okay, you might want to do something where the car sounds are coming from the left because maybe in our imagined cafe scene, okay, because that that's what I'm imagining this mix is basically. We're sitting down in a cafe, outdoor cafe. Things are going on. We're having trying to have a conversation, but cars keep driving by and and, and sirens keep interrupting. Okay, so. In this scene, maybe the, the car traffic is on the, uh, on the left, okay? So if I've got my car drive-by sounds, I want to move, maybe move those over to the left a little bit. Maybe not all the way, but some of the way. Um. Yeah, the traffic's a little more on that side, a little heavier on that side now, okay? So panning is the, the second line of defense, okay, for balancing out your mix overall. Use the two speakers, okay. A good, a good guideline is that if something is, uh, I guess, the main point of emphasis, it should probably be panned dead center, 12 o'clock, okay. If something is secondary in emphasis, it should probably be to one or both of the sides, okay. So anytime you've got something you want to be the main focus and... Quite frankly, usually dialogue is the main focus in a, in a movie type situation, yes? Okay, so dialogue should probably be panned dead center. In fact, in a 5.1 setup, right, if you're familiar with those kind of setups, there's usually a speaker right in the middle, and if you've ever noticed in your home, home stereo setup, right, the dialogue always comes out of that center channel. That's because you don't want left and right messing with your in the intelligibility of your speech, okay? So it's a good, a good guideline to put dialogue dead center, put other effects around it, left and right, okay? That's your second line of defense in terms of mixing, okay? So in this imagined scene, I've got dialogue and I've got cars driving by, yes? Sorry. Sorry, I was running late. Why did you notice them? Okay. Now, there's still a lot of space in this mix, yes? Okay, there's not much continual sound to give me a believable cafe scene, yes? I need what's called ambience. I need a track that's going to loop in the background that's going to give me the sense of being at this location, right? I've got the dialogue, which is my main point of emphasis. I've got my sirens, which are kind of my event sounds, which kind of interrupt things, which uh, are, are kind of interplaying with the story that's going on with the dialogue. But I don't have any kind of bed, any kind of background, if you will. Think of this as, as, if you're a visual person, think of this as putting a figure on like just a blank white background, right? Okay? Not very interesting, as, as opposed to, a, 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 I guess, a tree on a blank white background, right? Uh, if instead I put that tree in front of a mountainscape or a lakescape, right, it fills in the scene, right? I now have a context for where that tree goes, right? Same thing is happening here. I don't have a background. I don't have a context. Okay, and you notice I've set up a track called ambience. So I'm I'm just waiting in, in anticipation for this background ambience. Okay, if you look in your clip list, you should see something that says outside cafe loop one or loop outside cafe one loop. Yes, does everybody see that? Let's go ahead and drag that into our ambience track. Okay. 
And what do you notice about it in terms of length? It's short. Yeah, it's short, right? It doesn't quite cover the entire scene, right? But the fact that it is a loop, it is something that's loopable that we can repeat over and over again to create our background ambience, right? Okay? Means that we can repeat it in order to fill out the rest of the scene. And let me zoom out a little bit here to show you that, yeah, there's other things going on and it's not going to cover it, okay? So after you've dragged it and dropped it onto the track, but before you've deselected it and clicked on something else, and if you've already have deselected it, you can use the grabber tool to click on it and select it again, okay? If you go to region loop, you see there's an option for that, right? So, or clip loop for you guys, right? When you click on loop, it's going to default to something like eight loops. We probably don't need eight loops. We probably need something more like three, okay? You'll also notice there's another option if in, if in case you don't want to specify a certain number of loops, uh, you can actually specify the length of the loop. If I need this to loop for two minutes, I can say loop for two minutes, and it will take care of that being one and a half. Yeah? Um, is there a way to... Ah, you're talking about the grid? Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the grid mode up here in the top left-hand corner. Okay. Right now I'm leaving things in slip. But I'm going to go ahead and let me just hit this number of loops, three, and if I hit OK, everybody see that? Fills in the rest of my scene. Yes. Alex, your question? Yes, I was going to ask you. I don't, I don't see the... Uh, loop? I'm trying to loop, yeah. So region... Clip. clip, sorry, yeah. Okay. You guys are on Pro Tools nine or Pro Tools ten. It's clip for for some reason. They decided to. Uh, I, I guess a little bit of history. Pro Tools used to be owned by an audio company. Uh, they got bought by Avid, who is a video company. That's why some of this video terminology, such as clips, has invaded Pro Tools. Okay. Yeah. What now? Yeah. Pro Tools started a long time ago. Yeah. It's probably well, 20 plus, more than 20 years. Yeah. yeah, 25 years ago, yeah. Okay. But they've since then been bought by Avid, who's a video company, so they've started adopting some of the video lingo. That's why it now clips instead of regions, okay? So is everybody able to loop that in the background? Okay. That now becomes the bed, the ambience for your, okay? Maybe a little more believable. Believable now that we're at an actual cafe, right? Because we've got the kind of chatter going on in the background, okay? So the problem then becomes when I start to talk again, right? Uh, because why is there a quit that? Okay. okay. Can you hear me talking? No, right? Okay, the, the chatter is now drowning out the, the dialogue, which is supposed to be the main point of emphasis, yes? Okay. So... What's our first line of defense? Raise your voice or lower the loop. Yeah, volume is our first line of defense. So go back to the mix window. I would start with lowering the ambience. Okay, so I'm going to lower that maybe to just above the car sounds. Okay. Uh, Sound better? Touch with the waiter. Yes. Okay. Uh, now the the outside cafe loop it's is itself a uh, a stereo file, right? So we can't do panning left and right. Uh, we we could kind of move it to one side or the other, basically, but we can't pan it like we could the the car drive by noises. Okay. Uh, but that helps solve things a little bit. Okay. Now what if what if in our outdoor cafe we want to have music, right? Okay, we want to have some diegetic music. Diegetic is probably a new term for all of you, if not most of you. Anybody familiar with that term, diegetic? Yeah. It's within the world of the movie. Yeah. Diegetic means it's within the world of the movie or the story. Okay, it comes from the term diegesis, which is an old, I think it's a Greek term for story world. Okay. So when you have diegetic music, it's music that's part of the story world, not music that is uh, put in the scene by the, the filmmakers themselves, okay? Although, even when it's in the story world, right, it's put in there by the filmmakers themselves, right? Uh, the best way to explain this to you, okay, everybody's seen Star Wars, right? Okay, when the opening scene, right, 
the, the ships are flying by overhead. Okay, everybody understands that the London Symphony Orchestra is not on the Slave One with Princess Leia and R2D2 and C3PO. Yes. Okay, that's not music. That's part of the story world. That's non-diegetic music. Right. So fast forward to when we're on Tatooine and Han and and Luke are trying to get a ship. Right, and they're in the the cantina. Right, and there's a band playing at one end. Okay. That's music that's part of the story world. There's a band in the cafe playing music, right? So that's diegetic music, okay? Everybody clear on the difference? Okay. I, I mention this because for your video projects for next week, if there is going to be music, there needs to be a diegetic reason for the music, okay? Make sense? So I'm, I'm putting that restriction on you for your next assignment. Yeah, Alex. What about the explosion? Sorry. That had a sound well, well, yeah, that's that's a sound effect issue, yeah. The fact that there's no oxygen to convey the, the explosion, yeah. Let's talk just about music at this point. Okay, limit our, so everybody clear on the distinction there? I want to make sure you're clear. If you're not clear on that distinction, send me an email. And if you have an idea for how to put mu music in your video project for next week and you're not clear whether it's diegetic or not and you don't want to get dinged points for using non-diegetic music, talk to me, okay? So... We have our outdoor cafe. We want them to be playing music in our outdoor cafe, right? Okay, because that's what they do at outdoor cafes, just to kind of give us more ambiance, okay? We need some music, okay? On Blackboard, I, I, I created a link, let's see, to some CC music. And I'll get, if you're not familiar with what CC is, I'll talk about it a little bit later, okay? But I'm recommending this track, okay? It's nice, it's jazzy, it sets the outdoor cafe mood, okay? Uh, this link is on Blackboard just below the mixed demo. If you uh, hit that page earlier today, uh, earlier at the beginning of class, it might not have been there, so just hit refresh, it should be there. It says CC Mixter colon jazz, okay? It'll take you to this page where you can download this music that is okay to use, and there's a link right in the middle of the page which says download, okay? It's asking... It, brings up this page. I now want to click. If I control click, it should say save link as something like that. I'm going to go ahead and save it to my desktop so it's easy to find. And I already have it there because I already downloaded this earlier when I was prepping. Okay. Everybody able to download that mp3 file? Save it to the desktop. So once you have it on the desktop, Go back to your Pro Tools session, okay? Up until this point, right, we've been recording our own sounds into Pro Tools, okay? But Pro Tools is just as happy to let you import audio files that you've gotten from other sources, from your Marantz, from the internet, from your friend, okay? It's happy to let you import things into the project, okay? So in order to do that, if you go to File, Import, Audio, File, Import, Audio. Okay, it's going to bring up a dialog box for you. You want to navigate to the desktop. Everybody with me so far? You're, you're downloading still? Yes. or Okay. Okay. Okay, once you're on the desktop, I'll let uh, Jacob help you there okay once you're on the desktop if you click on the mp3 file it should highlight it yes and you should see should see it pop up down here where it says regions in current file okay so a, a word of warning here Pro Tools is a little more complicated to import files because uh, and it, it, this window might seem like overkill for you but the reason why this window is so complicated is that it's meant to be something you open once, click through your hard drive and find all the files you want, and then hit import, and they're all imported at the same time. So rather than going through the dialog for each file individually, okay, imagine if you had an audio project where you had hundreds of sound files that you wanted to import. Okay? Pro Tools designed this window so that you could camp out here for those hundreds of files, wait till you have them all, and then hit done and import them all at once. Okay? So it's probably overkill for one sound file, but it's perfect for importing dozens and dozens of files. Okay, that's the reason why this this window is a little more complicated than most. Okay, once you've got it highlighted in the finder up here, you'll see that it says regions in the current file. Okay, 
you want to hit this convert button. That's going to take care of adding it to the regions to import list. Okay. Until it's in this regions to import list, it's not actually going to import it. Okay. So if you skip this step of clicking convert, it's not going to get ready to import. Okay. Make sure it's in this regions to import list. Everybody with me? Okay. And then you can even just by the way, FYI, if you are trying to camp out here and import dozens of sound files, you have a little uh, preview box right here where you can play and stop and make sure this is the right sound file before you import it into your project, which is kind of nice. Yes? Yeah, make sure you're importing the right one, right? So hit done. It's going to ask you, yes, which folder do you want to set as your destination folder? I like to, when I hit this, this next dialog box, just confirm that I'm actually in my project. Mixed demo audio files. That's the right place. So I just clicked on this down, this drop-down list right here. Make sure that you're in your project. Keep in mind, every Pro Tools project on these hard drives has an audio files folder. Okay. If you get this wrong, you might be importing into somebody else's audio files folder. So that's why I, I get a little paranoid, and I like to check to make sure I'm in my project here. Once you are happy that you're in your project, hit open. It should process and open, uh, process and import it into your project. The next question is, do you want to put it in the regions list or do you want to put it on a new track? I've already got a music track set up for you, so you don't need to put it on a new track, but Pro Tools will put it on a new track for you if you want. So go ahead and leave this on region list or clip list. Is that what it says for you guys? Okay. Hit OK. And you should see it pop into your region list over here, or your clip list, okay? So we've got our outdoor jazzy cafe music, right, to add to the ambience. Yes, Amanda. Yeah, it might it might not do the because Pro Tools uncompresses everything to wave okay. along the way as you do the import process. So clicking and dragging is not advisable, I think, because you want to make sure that you have it do that the process thing. What now? I'm not sure. This has been the process for as long as I can remember. Uh, if they made it nice and uh, simple. Logic, you can just drag and drop, and Logic will happily deal with multiple audio fo formats all at the same time. But Pro Tools is pretty uh, anal, shall we say, about making sure everything is wave before it starts using it, or AIFF, whatever you've set the project to. Okay, so you now have this new file here. Okay, S Comer, it could be nice jazzy music. Okay, uh, something to know about the clip list. Okay, if you option click, it should start playing that file. Okay. So option clicking, option click and hold is a good way to preview sounds in the clip list before you drag them into your project. So if you're confused, as this clip list gets longer and longer, if you're confused which one you actually want to bring in, okay, you can do that. You can preview it by option clicking, okay. But I'm going to go ahead and click and drag this into my music track because it's ready made, yes, okay. And immediately you should notice a problem because if I start playing this, I can't hear anything else. This is supposed to be background music, not foreground music, yes? Okay? Okay. So, again, what's our first line of defense in mixing? Fader, right? Okay, let's bring the fader down. Maybe 15, 20 dB. Because this is, this is mastered music. Music that's been mastered has been, uh, m the, the volume has been maximized on this track, okay? So I'm going to bring it down to about negative 20. Let's hear what this sounds like. Okay. Better, but maybe not as good as I want it to be. She still sounds a little too bright to me, a little too foregrounded to me. I'd like to get her voice more in the background because this is, again, supposed to be background music, okay? As, as nice as this track is, as a jazzy accompaniment to our outdoor scene, right? Okay. So, this is where we're going to get into processing. Uh, and this is processing like audio processing, not processing like the programming language that if you took the intro to programming class last semester, okay? Uh, audio processing is a rabbit hole unto itself, okay? I'll just put that out there, okay? And if I don't want to get into everything about audio processing, but I do want to show you two key techniques for managing your mix, okay? The first, okay, everybody clear on that? Because we could easily go down a whole rabbit hole here talking about processing. I want to show you two quick things you can do to help 
push things in the background and pull things forward to the foreground, okay? The first thing to help push things further to the background, okay, is EQ. So go up here, if you've got your mix window up, find the music track, where it says inserts, you have something that says inserts A to E, something like that, okay? Yes? So click on that first rectangle under the word inserts on the music track, and you see it says no insert by default. We're going to actually put an insert in here. You want to go to multi-channel plugin, whoop, whoop, and you want to go to EQ, and you want to go to one band, okay? There are other ones, okay? Uh, the, the, the more bands you have, the more complicated the EQ plugin. I want you to focus on the one band EQ, okay? So insert, multi-channel plugin, EQ, one band, stereo. Everybody find that? I'm seeing a head shake no from Taylor. Okay. This is where you are, right? Like this, Taylor? Okay. Right here it says insert, click. Yep. Under the, the, the box underneath it, yes. Okay. Multi-channel plugin, EQ, EQ3, one band, parentheses, stereo is what you're looking for. Okay. That should bring up a little window. looks like this, yes? Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay. EQ lets you not just adjust the overall volume of the track, but the volume of respective frequencies within the track. Okay. So if you, uh, what is nice about EQ, if you want to turn down the highs but leave the lows up, you can do that. If you want to turn down the lows but leave the highs up, you can do that. Okay. That's high frequencies. Okay. Make sense? So the, the, the thing I want you to do here, I want you to click over here where it says type. I want you to click this kind of sloping down to the right. To, you click it and it should say something like low pass here. Yes. And this graph now has a nice big long slope to it. Yes. Okay. Congratulations, you just added a low pass filter. Okay. And to parse out that term, it means that, if, okay, if I talked about high frequencies and low frequencies, and I just had you put in a filter that says low pass, what do you think that means? The low frequencies are going to pass through, okay? So if you play this again, everybody hear how she's kind of darker sounding, right? If you're not convinced, okay, I haven't touched any of the dials yet, okay, all I did was in, insert and change it to low pass, okay, the thi if you're not convinced that this is making a change, there's a button here to help you, to help convince you, it's called the compare button, if you click that, it will disengage the filter and play it for you without the filter, that's before, that's after, before, after. Okay. Now, we might be dampening the highs too much at this point, but one sure way, again, we talked about first line of defense volume, second line of defense pan, but the third line of defense, one sure way to make sure things sound backgrounded is to dampen the highs. Okay. Dampen the high frequencies. And the EQ low pass is one way to do that. Okay. Now, I can mess with this graph a little bit. I can change this frequency. So if you click this little silver ball and move it to the right and then play, you'll notice that it gets a little higher. Again, compare. That's before. Okay. Everybody hear what's going on? Okay. You feel free to adjust this, but w again, one sure way to make sure your background layers stay in the background, put in a simple one band EQ, switch it to low pass, and lower it. Okay? What's the purpose of the different bands? <coughs> the different band, oh, yeah, these different band the types? Uh, or I know when we first locked it to put the EQ in, it was like band one, band two, band oh, three. It's how many filters are part of that EQ. Oh, okay. An e a one band EQ is going to be one filter. Four band is going to be four filters. Seven band is going to be seven filters. Okay? Yeah. I'm trying to keep things simple because I realize this is, this is again, 
processing is a rabbit hole you can go down for a long long way okay I'm trying to keep it simple for the folks that are this is who are thinking oh my goodness a filter okay make sense um, okay now we might want to do this so I'm gonna go ahead and close this I'm gonna say that's that's a good level for her okay I can close this window if I ever need to get it back if I just simply double click on where I or excuse me one single click where it was inserted it'll bring that window back up and I can readjust okay uh, I might want to do the same thing with my ambience so I'm gonna go to the ambience track multi-channel EQ one band okay so I'm on the ambience track inserting a one band EQ okay and maybe for the ambience low pass is not the it basically disappears when I do low pass okay so the other one I want to show you is what's called a high shelf okay high shelf takes the high frequencies and lets you raise or lower them okay think of it instead of cutting out the high frequencies like a low pass filter does because another name for a low pass filter is a high cut filter if you think about it you're either passing the low frequencies and cutting the highs that's really kind of the same thing okay a high shelf is gonna let you instead of just cutting them out it's gonna let you raise or lower those frequencies okay so if I do high shelf now on my ambience track, I can pull them down a little bit. This is what they sound like if I raise it. I don't know, they're hard to hear still. So I might want to play with the volume still a little bit, okay, in addition to the EQ, okay? But low cut, or excuse me, low pass and high shelf are very uh, important um, EQ elements to managing that background to the mix, okay? Uh, as I said, volume is your first line of defense, but it's probably not going to get you where you want to be all by itself. Make sense? Especially in a digital environment, okay? And I don't want to talk about analog versus digital, but I feel like I'm saying a lot of things I don't want to talk about today. So I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep things straightforward and simple for you guys. Okay. So EQ, that's how to get things in the background. Now, I've still got a problem with my dialogue, yes? Still hard to hear me, yes? Okay. I could bring, yes, That's so that's one strategy that Aiden has already uh, jumped to. I could bring up the highs on my voice, yes? Okay. What now? Yeah, I'm already pretty high up on the fader, though, okay? The other thing that you can do is compression, okay? I'm going to show you one knob compression here, okay, which there, are, which is very, very, very simple. You thought one band EQ was simple? One knob compression is very simple as well. So go, go to the voice track, click on Insert, Plugins. Where is it at? We want to go to dynamics. Where would it go? Oh, there it is. Okay, I missed it. Okay, and we're gonna go to compressor limiter den three mono. Do we see that? Okay, but you should see something that says compressor. Yep. So on the voice track, plugin dynamics compressor is what we're looking for. Okay. Now. There's a lot of knobs here. I could spend a whole class talking about compression. The one that I want to point out to you is the gain. Go ahead and turn the gain. I, I tested this out before. You should be able to turn the gain up by about 10 dB here, and then hit play and listen to what happens to my voice magically. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Glad you can even answer short notice though. Hear how it jumps out? Yes? Okay. What compression does is it takes what are a, a, a lot of dynamic range changes and compresses them so you can bring up the level overall okay that's compression in a nutshell okay so just um, I just want to introduce this idea that if you've got a key element of your sound design that you want to bring to the front like dialogue dropping in a compression turning up the gain about 8 to 10 to 12 DB okay 12 might be pushing it okay will help you push it to the foreground yeah Jojo Oh, compression takes the dynamic range and actually shrinks it so that you can then low, raise the overall volume. Think of it this way. If you've got something that is ranging from 0 to 10, okay, 
compression effectively can shrink that range from 0 to 5, and then you can raise the volume overall. It gives you some headroom so you can raise the gain again. Okay? So that's simple one-knob compression, okay? Which is really simple. It's almost malpractice the fact that I'm the fact that I'm malpractice that I'm making it so simple for you guys, okay? Um, but compression, everybody saw how I got there? Again, you can close and open these windows. Uh, and I'll, also I'll do I'll run the compare knob again is your friend. If I hit play. Sorry. That's me without the compression. The That's me with the computer. Okay, everybody hear the difference? Okay. It's especially going to bring out uh, bass equalities in your voice as well, okay? So it give you that nice radio announcer type sound to your voice, okay? Um, okay. Last thing I want to add to the mix window, because we do need to get to talking about your assignment at some point here. Uh, if you go back to track, you may decide that the overall volume of this needs to come up or down, okay? And rather than go through track by track and raise and lower the volume, it's really nice to have a master fader, okay? So go to track, new, and before when it said audio track, I want you to click that and drop it down to where it says master fader, okay? This will give you one fader that controls the overall level of your entire project. Okay, this is kind of the last stop before it goes out. Okay, so if I hit one new, and actually I want to do stereo, excuse me. So stereo master fader, because this is a stereo project. Okay, hit create. <clears throat> You're going to see that it opens a new track. It's missing a few components, yes, in the mix window. There's no pan knobs, there's no mute uh, solo buttons. Okay. I've covered mute before. Uh, I didn't cover solo. What is if mute turns off a track? What do you think solo does? Yeah, solo turns off all the other tracks. It's a very handy knob. So if you want to just hear me talking to you in the cafe, hit solo. Uh, turns when you're late. Okay, so that's just me. It turns off all the other tracks. Okay, but all that's gone from the master fader, and it lets you control the overall level. Uh, See, I can turn it down. Oh, you can even short though. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> when I'm dealing with my my master fader, mm -hmm. if, I, if I messed up when I was creating it, how do I get rid of it and like recreate using stereo? Oh, you need to get rid of a track. Yes, I need to get rid of my. my Any track, if you want to get rid of it, if you just click here and go to track, should be something that says delete. Project. Yep. That lets you delete the track. Yes. None of my other tracks are outputting. Make sure that the master is set to the same output as your other tracks. So make sure it's set to the fast track. Yep. Okay. So everybody got the master fader track. One last thing you want, might want to do. You might want this track, this entire project to fade in at the beginning or fade out at the beginning. Yes. Taylor is happy about this. Yes. You want to be able to fade, right? Okay. So down here on the master fader track, uh, okay, in the edit window, you're going to see a line. And if you don't see a line, look at this uh, option right here where it says volume. Oh, look, that volume is the only option in that list. Great, okay. So you should see a line here, okay. This line is much like the line that some of you started playing around with in Amadeus. You can add points at will. I can raise the volume there. I can pull it back down here, okay. And I can go to the end of the track, and I can click and add a point, click and add a point, and then pull it down. Okay. So now, if I rewind the track and hit play, isn't that nice? Oh, there you are. Yeah. We're in class. Can you tell them we're in class? <laughs> Some of you didn't know we had a phone in here. Okay. So, everybody got the fade in? Okay. That's fading in and out for the whole project. You can do this on a track by track basis as well. Okay. So, here's automation one level deeper. Okay. 
if I go to my siren track, say I want this, uh, I don't know, siren to fade in for some reason, okay? Right here where it says waveform, below where it says sirens, if you click there, you're going to see a lot of options. The one you want is volume. It's going to give you that line for that track. And you can do the same thing. You can add points. Okay, so say I want my, sir my uh, siren to actually lower a little bit, okay? Everybody able to get there? It's right here where it says waveform. If you click, it'll show you this uh, drop-down list, okay? Volume is the one you want to be able to change the, vo the level of that. And if I click, jump over here, watch how cool this is with the track. If I hit play, the fader's gonna actually move here. No hands, folks, look at that, okay? <laughs> okay. Everybody see that? Okay. There are other ways to do automation. That's by far the easiest. And auto volume automation is probably a good starting point for those of you that are getting into the idea of, of automation. Uh, you can, in a DAW, you can pretty much automate everything. Okay. But don't start with trying to automate everything. Start with trying your hand at a little bit of volume automation. Okay. If you're done with the volume automation on that track, the way you get back to moving the regions and the clips around is to click on volume again and move it back to waveform, okay? Okay. So, you've created this great mix for your project. You now want to share it with the world, and the world doesn't have a copy of Pro Tools, yes? Okay, can we all agree on that? You want to turn this into a sound file that you can uh, export and send a post on SoundCloud, email to your friends, etc. okay? Go to File, and you're gonna see an option that says Bounce to Disk. So File, Bounce to Disk, okay? It's gonna ask you uh, what the bounce source is, yes, okay? You wanna make sure that the bounce source is what you've been listening to. So if you've been listening to the fast track, make sure it says fast track here. If you've been listening to the built-in output, make sure it says built-in output here. But it's gonna give you a wave. For format, you probably don't want multiple mono. What that means is that it's gonna give you a left channel file and a right channel file. You probably want a stereo file, what's called interleaved, okay? Uh, bit depth and 44.1 is fine. Uh, let me go back to file type here. You'll notice that mp3 is an option in the file type. And you're more than welcome to use the mp3 compression in, in Pro Tools. If you remember from my little brief uh, lecture on mp3 though, mp3 implementation is up to the software developer, how they get you to an mp3 file. Okay, For my money, for my ears, the MP3 compressor in Amadeus sounds better than the MP3 compressor in Pro Tools. I'm just going to say it, okay? Uh, so your MP3 files will probably sound better if you first bounce them as a WAV file from Pro Tools, then open them in Amadeus and save as MP3, okay? Uh, just a word of warning, okay? If, if that's too many steps for you, fine. Switch it to MP3 here, okay? So the, po the, the process here is one of, once you've selected the interleave format for stereo, once you've selected the bit depth and everything, hit the bounce button. It's going to ask you where to save it. By default, it's going to use that same audio files folder where your project is. That might or might not be where you want it to be. So this is my uh, cafe scene. Great. Awesome. I'm going to put it on the desktop. I'm going to hit save. And you'll notice that I'm going to turn it down because it's actually Okay. One of the things that Pro Tools does, it actually counts through while it's bouncing. So this is what's called a real-time bounce. Okay. So if your project is two minutes long, it's going to take two minutes to bounce. Factor that in when you're trying to finish stuff right before midnight. Okay. Yes. Does Pro Tools have an offline bounce? Uh, I, this version does not. That's HD type stuff. Okay. So the longer your project is, the longer it's going to take you to bounce. Keep that in mind. Okay. Everybody clear on the bouncing to disk process? And it'll automatically cut over your last track ends? Yes, it should, yeah. Yeah. You can't click on save? Excellent. Got it? Oh, yeah, you got to give it a name. Yeah. Okay. Everybody clear on that? 
Okay. That took a lot longer than I anticipated. But that is, that's essentially everything I wanted to teach you about Pro Tools for your project, okay?